Well, happy Friday, everybody. Um, another week almost behind us. We just got off a Zoom meeting with the immediate family talking about an upcoming uh, concert we're going to do. It will be streamed. We're going to be, you know, of course, recording it uh, to no audience um, or just a, a couple of people. We're, we were fortunate enough that uh, our friend uh, Don Lombardi of DW Drums is going to let us use their soundstage and their technical staff. So we're going to go out there, um, I think October 3rd, we're filming it. We're going to rehearse a few days and then do the show and then we'll put it out there for you. And we're really excited about it. It's going to be a chance to play again, which kind of brings me to how I want to start today off. I've got a fun tune I'm going to do and I'll tell you about that afterwards. But um, every day I just kind of find myself sitting and I'm just in such not fear, but concern for the future of the industry business that I, that I love with all my heart and I've spent my entire life um, being a part of, and that's the music business. And I'm seeing more and more, uh, there's, there's organizations like Save Our Stages um, that are doing all they can to keep, um, especially small venues, um, you know, big, big sports arenas and stuff, well, they've got enough financial backing and they'll have sporting events and stuff. So uh, I don't know how quickly music events will get into those facilities, um, but it's going to be a while. But the small venues, the clubs, um, I'm really in such fear for so many of them. I keep hearing all the time. And this isn't just in the States. I'm hearing about some of the great venues in Japan um, closing. And I'm sure this is going on in Europe and South America. Um, because all these, these clubs, you know, they still have bills to pay, yet they can't have any business. There's no opportunity for people to play. So on the one hand, I'm, I'm really in, in kind of fear for where the future lies with those, because as especially um, for young musicians, this is really where you hone your skills, when you can play clubs and small venues and really develop your following and, and get your, you know, your chops together. Um, so I'm worried about that. I'm worried about when I think about like, um, uh, cause I've been to Berkeley and a, a few times now and done master classes there and, uh, in the Berkeley college of music in Boston. And, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, these kids from all these different music schools. We have Lama, there's several schools in Los Angeles and uh, these, you know, young students are, are devoting their, their lives to wanting a future in the music business. And they're coming out of that school to zero at this point. You know, they have all these chops, all this enthusiasm, this fire this in their gut. And, uh, and there's no, no place to go with it. So I'm deeply concerned for them. I'm deeply concerned when I think about, like, just coming off of Phil Collins' tour uh, not that long ago. And I think about the massive amount of people involved in a tour because that was, you know, that was a, a tour where we were doing stadiums. So we had a huge crew. We had tons of bus drivers and truck drivers and caterers, all of the sound and lights and grip people, the, the, the roadies, um, everybody involved, the medical staff that you have at these gigs, everything. Uh, so it's just, I just, I'm just, you know, I, I, I don't want to be Debbie Downer about these things, but I also want to be a realist about it. And I'm just very concerned for where the future of our business is going to be, uh, especially if once things start to open up, because everybody's going to be chomping at the bit to get out there. I know with, with our group, um, this is all we talk about. I mean, this is all as a, as a group of players, for the most part, we've been together for 50 years. And this is what we've done for 50 years together. And all of a sudden, the kibosh is put on everything. So I'm, I'm hopeful for the future. I'm, uh, I, I'm just looking at it is that this is a, a terrible kind of pothole on the highway that we're on. And we're, we're having to wait for this to get filled and navigate our way on, to continue on our, our journey. And, uh, and I hope this for everybody who's aspiring in the music business on whatever level 
you are, be it, be it an, an artist, a, a, a band, a, uh, guys that, that and, and girls that I know that they love being in the crew. That's really their passion is they love being out there and humping that gear and getting it up and, and the sense of pride that they feel when they've put on an amazing show because without them, we have no show. Um, it's, it's, it would just be, it would be impossible. Um, they are really the, the lifeblood of, of this entire thing. And then you think beyond that of all the, the managerial companies that are having to lay staff off because there's nothing for them to manage. I mean, they're, we have managers and they're, they're working really hard and we're having some really good success in terms of how our, our new video is going, how the previous video was going. We have an EP coming out. There's things to be doing, but it's not like booking a tour and getting the, getting the cats on the road and traveling the world and, and bringing joy and pleasure to people everywhere because that's, that's what I love the most. Um, the business side of it just comes with it. That's fine, but it's that thing of getting on stage and making eye contact with people out there and knowing that maybe they've had a rough day and this couple of hours is going to be really the highlight of their day of just getting out and just blowing off some steam and, and hearing some live music. And that's one of the reasons, like when I'm on the road, I try to get out and, and talk to the crowd and hang with them. It's just to find out people's lives, what they're up to and all that. It's a shared relationship. It's There's a, a, a symbiosis that takes place between uh, artist and, and audience. And it's one of the things I've valued the most. I've never felt that that wall, you know, that distance between us. I love connecting with people and I can't wait to get out there again. But but like I was saying, my heart's really with the young artists right now that are just, we're just starting to get their foot in the door and then the door got slammed shut on them. And I hope that they're all able to hold on throughout all of this and uh, at the end of the day, be able to continue their musical journey um, for, for the future sake. Hold on one sec. Um, so, so that, that, that's, that's that. It's just, I, can't, I think about this every day and I talk to all my friends. I just was talking to, to my bandmates. Uh, last night I was talking with a great keyboard player, CJ Vanston, who I've done lots of work with over the years. And, uh, and we all just are kind of echoing each other's sentiments to each other. You know, it's like a support group, I guess, at this point. Um, but chances are the music part of, of, life is going to be one of the last things to come back. It's one of those things that's never taken that seriously by the powers that be, yet it's one of the absolutely most critical things for the soul of a society. And uh, there's just battles going on now, just trying to get some financing to keep you know clubs alive uh, until they can reopen and stuff. So we'll see. Fingers are crossed. This time it's this finger and I'm not going to change that because this is really what I'm hopeful of. So, okay, um, on, on to music today. Everybody seems to really be enjoying uh, Judith Owen's music. And I pulled out uh, just one of her really crazy songs that uh, as soon as she played this for me, I just looked at her and I said, you are just unbelievable. Um, she had been watching a, um, a BBC documentary um, over in England, and it was a documentary about uh, sex bots, um, sexual robots. And um, it was very, really comprehensive and all that, and talking about, you know, it costs, you know, upwards of a couple of hundred thousand dollars for one of these computer and, you know, anatomically perfect loving creatures. Um, and one of the aspects of it was, you know, what happens to some guy who uh, who doesn't have that kind of dough, but has that kind of desire? And she found a thing about secondhand sex bots, <laughs> used sex bots. And uh, she saw this documentary about that. And this guy who, it is his everything. And he probably got it on Craigslist or something like that. And, got it home, tidied it all up, and then, uh, but as the, the documentary went on, um, apparently they were, they were in the kitchen, and he was tidying her up, and across the room in the kitchen, 
there's a woman kind of sitting there scowling and it was the guy's wife and her, her thing was she really didn't care about this as long as it's not real it's it's okay and so she sort of shares him with this uh this um other occupant of their of their lives so judith immediately i mean she's one of these people like you just you plant a seed and there's a full forest germinates by the end of the day so she wrote a song called secondhand sex bot and we recorded it the incredibly great richard thompson is playing guitar on this um, and it's really interesting to me this is like all these things become full circle one of the very early gigs we did with james taylor in england uh, was a thing called the Lincoln Festival, and it was this a state outside of London, and it was it was just like you went there, and it was like thousands and thousands of people, and you know big fires going. It looked like something out of Braveheart or something. It was really amazing, and um, and one of the groups that was on the bill was Fairport Convention, were one of the great English kind of folk bands. Um, and that was Richard's group. So we actually did a, a gig together back around 1970 or so, 71, right in there. Um, it was amazing. And it was a weird gig for me because uh, Russ Kunkel's son, Nathaniel, was with us. He was a newborn. Uh, he was very young and, and uh, you know, maybe six months old or something. I don't know. Um, but we were sitting in the hotel room and I was entertaining him. And they had a, a ball on the end of a little staff with a suction cup on it. And you could, you know, put it on the floor and he could kind of sit there and hit it. And I'm goofing around playing with him and I take the thing up and lick it and go, and stuck it on my forehead. And I'm sitting there nuzzling with him and playing and we're having just a grand old time together um, playing. And then did that for probably about a half hour with him. I kept his attention up and everything. Oh, the vacuuming is going on right outside the door here. Um, this is great. I'm going to go ahead and do this because I really don't want to do this entire thing over again. So I'm just going to do no matter what the hell you hear out there. Uh, at least it'll cover the sound of my little toys in the window that are solar powered that sit there and people keep going. I can hear your clock going. And it's actually Napoleon and the Queen and the Queen's Corgi and Mr. Bean and all of them are sitting there going. <coughs> it's like the hands going like this or the Pope's you know doing this. Um, so I'm playing with this toy with Nathaniel, and eventually I, uh, I take the toy off, pop it off, and I set it down, and everybody looks at me and goes, I had a black hickey in the middle of my forehead. This thing had created one hell of a hickey. Well, I have to go do this festival and everything. People thought I had this long kind of a duster coat on and everything, and people thought I was some kind of a mystic, and that was my third eye. It was the weirdest it was the weirdest thing. And I think I think it was Tim Harden. As I recall, I think it was Tim Harden. We all had trailers and stuff. And at one point they called Tim to come out of, to, to perform. And I think he maybe been drinking or something, but he comes out and holding his acoustic guitar, steps out of the door of the trailer and falls face down on top of his guitar. And all you see is wood flying out from under him and it just exploded. Um, I don't know what the uh, the result of that was. I was uh, I was in deep enough uh, stress about the giant third eye on my forehead, which lasted probably about three weeks. I would say probably it was certainly there, um, still there on the flight home from England <laughs> back to the states. Um, learn a lesson learned. I've never stuck a suction cup on my face since. And other places, perhaps, but as long as clothing can cover them, that's okay. But you don't like these people you see getting their faces tattooed. And you go, boy, if you ever decided to change your mind, this was really not the smartest thing you could have done. You know, anywhere on your body, cover it up. It's easy. And when you're going through removal, if you're doing that, you can have some scarring. But, you know, when your face becomes your, your, you know, your canvas, it's a... It's a commitment, that's for sure. So I'm, I'm digressing. All I, I want to say was that Richard Thompson's the wonderful guitarist on this track. So uh, here we go. This is Judith Owen's secondhand sex spot, her, her homage to Craig. <laughs>
have certain needs well love my wife love my home and my family don't have looks don't have cash and my smile's bent i have bent i don't shine in that department so so i read up and looked at the prices you might think that it's just a midlife crisis but silicone silly man acting like a boy so smart really listen to the lyrics or if you can't hear them directly here go on judith's youtube channel and pull up secondhand sex spot there's also a, a live version of it that we did in her living room that um down in new orleans and uh, and she tells a bit of the story about all of this which is really funny because she's so entertaining um and on the track it's richard thompson and it's also pedro segundo playing drums on it, and Gabriella Swallow, like all of the stuff at the end that, where the, the sex bot is kind of uh, shorting out, having a little synaptic meltdown. And that's Gabby on, on her cello in there. Always a joy to play with, with Gabby. Um, so it's funny, but, but every time somebody plants a seed in Judah's mind about something, she comes up with like just amazing songs about it. Be, being the most deeply heartfelt, poignant things, or just the craziest stuff in the world. And uh, so that's a, that's a treat, but people seem to be responding really well to her, and she's one of my favorite artists to work with. So so um, it's fun sharing these things uh, on, on the channel with her, uh, with you, of her, however you would say that. Um, and now I'm going to get running here. I have a, a 2 o'clock interview to do, and then... Um, 
I, the fires are still raging, but uh, the area where I live last night was the first time I've seen stars since all of this began. It was a little hazy, but still. But I came out this morning I, and, and the air was a little bit more smoky smelling uh, than it was last night. So maybe winds have shifted again, but it's uh, it's so scary. You know, the, the, I mean, they're talking now that some of these fires may not be out till like November. Um, that they're just going to keep on burning because there's just no way to gain control over this much um, destruction that's out there. So, man, my, my heart is so with the, the firefighters. And like I posted a picture on my Facebook page yesterday, one of the uh, water dropping helicopters. They, well, they've been flying over my house. There's obviously something uh, that I'm in the path of where they're going and refilling because there's some huge reservoirs down here in Southern California, and I think one of them's I'm in the flight path. So I was out in the yard working, and all of a sudden I heard this sound, and I just grabbed my, I had my phone with me, and I just grabbed it. And, and so it looks like some bizarre insect flying through the air, the way the picture turned out. Uh, but those people are amazing. They're remarkable human beings, truly heroic, you know, putting themselves in this incredible danger. And so they're interviewing firefighters who are out there fighting fires as their houses were burning. So it's, it's deep. And my brother-in-law was the, the captain of where my sister lives in Montana. It's all volunteer fire department. And, uh, and my brother-in-law was the, uh, the chief for a long time of their, of their fire department. And he's still a volunteer. He retired from it. But, you know, these guys uh, were really uh, yeah, well-trained. It's volunteer, but boy, it's one of those things that as soon as anything's going on, they all get an alert and they just drop whatever they're doing and they head directly to the firehouse, grab, you know, whatever emergency vehicles that they're going to need for this. And they, they head out and I really respect them for that. It's, uh, you know, you never know what you're going out to. You know, and they're, they're doing, going out to everything, you know, car accidents, fires, um, all kinds of stuff. It's amazing. So. Okay, well, we've covered a lot of territory from the, the, where the music industry is to sex robots to fires. So I don't know how much more I can contribute to that. I don't know what he's thinking about. I came in this morning and uh, he actually was on the other side of the room and I left for about 15 minutes, came back and he's sitting there again. So I don't know. I really don't. Maybe he's from the union and kind of keeping an eye on me, making sure this is all legitimate. Could be. We used to have that when we do sessions there would be a union rep would come by to make sure everything was kosher on the session, that it was all union members and, and all that stuff. And some of these guys were unbelievable. We did some projects where we would just all oh, get quiet and lock the studio door. <laughs> when, and then we'd all hear his for a while. And then finally the car would drive off because <laughs> whatever. So, okay, well, look, take good care of yourselves. Um, have a great weekend. I'm not sure what I'm going to do this weekend. I, I may, I'll drop in. I may just kind of take the weekend off. I mean, I, I've, I've got other, th some things I have to take care of, and I, I might just kind of just focus on that for the weekend and see, and then just come back on Monday. But I'll probably at least stop by and say hi and wish everybody a, a nice day. And uh, thank you again, all of you people that are working so hard every day. Um, I get uh, comments and, and notices and uh, stuff on my Facebook page uh, from doctors and nurses and all of the people that are really kind of the, the term first responders is kind of doesn't really encompass what this is all about because there are people on so many levels. You know, you can, it's like peeling an onion of your life. Every, every layer you go through, there's somebody doing something that's doing something to try to maintain some semblance of order in our lives, which is becoming more chaotic as this continues on. So, you know, take a second, just go, God, thank you, all of you, for doing this. Even if you're just saying it to yourself, just to acknowledge that there are these remarkable people working so hard every day. And uh, try to visit over the weekend and uh, just uh, wish you all the very best. So... Here we go. I'm out of here. Bye.